Very good. Testing, one, two, three. All right, very good. Let's get started. Hello, everybody. My name is John Mayer. Sorry for that, uh, for that uh, um, stage presence uh, mic checking going on. We want to make sure we've got a, a, a high quality audio for the recordings. Um, and even though we've, we, we all get on 15, 20 minutes early and test it, um, the, 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 the setup is finicky. We've got people in two different cities and three different offices uh, managing and controlling. So anyhow, hello everybody. My name is John Mayer and I'm the Executive Director of CALI, the Center for Computer Assisted Legal Instruction. And I want to welcome you to week three of Topics in Digital Law Practice. The topic for this week is technology in the courts, and we'll get to our speaker in just a second. I've got a little bit of housekeeping to cover. This is a picture of me. Uh, it's a different one from last week, recently taken, so that I'm not just a disembodied voice. Hello. There is. Uh, I wanted to remind you that there is uh, no credit that we are. We are not offering any CLE credit for for this course. Uh, we haven't gone to any of the states and, and filled out the paperwork or done any of that thing. I understand that some states allow for self-study, um, but that is entirely uh, the responsibility of the attendee uh, or the student. Um, and I just wanted to remind people because we've been getting lots and lots of questions about that. Um, we may look into doing this in future iterations of this course or other courses, but um, we haven't done the, uh, the necessary work for this course. A reminder, there's three goals for this course. We wanted to give students, law students, access to up-to-date technology, uh, technical information about law practice. We wanted to inform law faculty about the same things because we believe that the changing nature of law practice can inform their teaching. And, um, and as sort of a derivative benefit, we wanted to create an enduring resource that would uh, help future audiences, which is to say law students who could not attend this course because everything is being recorded, uh, law faculty who uh, wanted to see how, how this online distance learning process works. Um, and so your homeworks are more than just useful for you, at least we hope they are useful for you, they are also useful for uh, future audiences of students and law faculty who will look and read them and say, hey, we can, we can do things like this and, or we can build upon the foundations that you've created. And so we're trying to design the homeworks in such a way that they are not just useful as learning experiences for you, but also useful as uh, tools or resources or content that could be built upon and expanded in the future. So our solution for meeting these three goals is this massive online open course. Um, I, I just looked at a number that uh, said there were over 800 or over 790 people registered for this course. Not all of you attend live, um, but we've been seeing some increasing numbers in the uh, views, the video views, which is wonderful. Thank you very much. So the homework are all turned in on a wiki at tdlp.wikispaces.com. And we've done a new thing with the homeworks. Now when, now when you type in that little dash one or dash two to indi indicate back to us that you've completed the homework, we give you a badge. So let me uh, alt tab over to the uh, homework wiki just to show you what I mean. So, uh, so here's the uh, here's the home page of the homework wiki, and down below is where students are supposed to put their put their name. If you haven't put your name there and you're doing the homework, um, how would we know, right? So this is where you would edit. First, you would join this wiki, and uh, when you come to this page and you're not a member, it will ask you to join. Um, we're monitoring this quite a bit so that uh, we'll approve your joining of the wiki quite quickly. Um, you see that. Some people, well, quite a few people have gotten homework one done and a few people have finished homework two as well. That's wonderful. If you click on any of these, you'll see the legend for all the badges. I've already put up the, the badge for homework three because we'll be giving it out. Uh, it's actually live right now. You can go view homework three for technology in the courts. And we will gradually reveal the badges for the rest of the homeworks, you know, as the time comes. And there will be a completed all homeworks uh, big boss badge um, that we provide to whoever completes all nine homeworks at the end. All right. 
Don't forget, if you haven't taken the pre-course survey, this is probably the last time I'll bug you about this. Um, but that feedback about your expectations for this course helps us immensely. Um, it's linked through from the blog, so you don't have to remember this, uh, uh, this long, uh, crazy URL. If you have a question during the course, you can ask it inside the question box. We will either answer it right away if it's something to do with sort of like the operations of the course. And if it's for the speaker, it gets fed to me and I'll feed it to the speaker after they're finished talking. And if we don't have enough time to get to all the questions, then we will um, put it on the wiki. And here's the questions from week two. There's still a few that we're going to go bug Mark Wartz and to, uh, to help us fill out. I've taken a first stab at answering some of these and put some links in. Um, you know, these, these questions, uh, this, this is one of those unexpected values of this course is I didn't realize that these questions will form sort of an FAQ, uh, frequently asked questions on the topic itself, you know, and uh, some of these questions are excellent and they've really made me think about how we might, um, you know, come up with longer answers um, for these things, all right? So don't hesitate to ask your questions. This is week three, it's technology in the courts. And our speaker is Jim McMillan. Jim is uh, with the National Center for State Courts and he's actually been with them for uh, a long time. We were just chatting. He's been there longer than I've been with Cali since 1990. He is uh, their principal or one of the many principal court technology consultants. If there's anybody that knows about this topic more than Jim, I don't know them. Um, he spends a lot of time consulting with courts. Um, he's uh, co-authored uh, reports, uh, given presentations on this all over the place. I've seen him talk on this, um, and I am so delighted that he uh, that he agreed to come on and, and talk about this. So I'm going to ask Austin uh, to uh, give Jim the screen, and uh, let's get started with our presentation. All right. Hi, I'm there. <laughs> this is Jim McMillan. Hi, Jim. Can confirm that we can hear you. All right, good. Well, let's see if we can get a screen going. All right. Let's get... All right. Are you guys seeing the PowerPoint slide? Yes, we are. All right, good. Yes, we are. Okay. Let's give it a quick forward and back here. So hopefully we'll be going to the next... You know, let's try this. So you know my story. What I, one of the jokes I like to tell people, and I, I don't know that if it's necessarily really a joke or a just an apocryphal story. You know the difference between technology people and non-technology people. No. The di the difference is that technology people are surprised when it works. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, so are you guys seeing the overview slide now? No, still seeing the front slide. All right, let's see. I was afraid of that. That's what happens when you have dual screens going. Ah, I was wondering why. Uh... That's why we're having a little bit of issue here. Yeah. All right. So how about now? What are you guys seeing? I can see overview, but it's not um, in slideshow mode. Slideshow mode. Let's try this. I have a feeling that because it's going to see my second screen, it's going to want to flip it over there, and that's what happened. So let's do this. Hang on. I'm going to, have to put it into. This is what happens when you have too much technology. Uh, let's use one display. And it's now it should be turning all kinds of different flashing and things. That's right. All right. So let's say yes to that. And let's put it into slideshow mode. Now, hopefully this means that everything will be showing on the same thing. There you go. Front, we, we see the front slide now. All right, great. All right. All right, so technology in the courts. 
Today we're going to be talking about uh, a whole bunch of different things, and so this is 30 years of technology in 30 minutes, and so we'll try to get through as much as we can, and I'm looking forward to hearing everybody's comments and, and, uh, and uh, their, your experience in this area. So let's just talk about the core technology framework first. Core technology framework is something that uh, my colleagues have uh, developed to uh, show how technology is able to, or shall we say, is a driver to the business. And the same thing, though, is that the business of the courts and the legal profession in general is also uh, driving what is developed in technology. So that's why we're seeing a lot of different things, particularly in courtroom technology, in video technology, um, various different uh, aspects of communications, uh, try to be there to uh, a lot of people taking great advantage of it. So, uh, you know, this is something that we're really trying to uh, try to create as a foundational uh, way of thinking about how this uh, this stuff works together. All right. Something I've it hit me very early on was that we really are two businesses. There was a lot of stuff talked about back in the 90s about divesting and, and focusing on the core business. And I thought to myself, well, I'd love to divest myself with the judges, but <laughs> they, they tend to be a, a kind of an important part of our operation. So we actually have two competing businesses under one uh, roof of the courthouse. And those are, we have a process business, which is kind of more of an industrial model, uh, you know, trying to you know, get some, some things done in terms of organization, producing documents, uh, doing these uh, very different administration. But then we have a whole side of the world that uh, is related to the decision needs. So things like legal research is certainly in the decision needs side of the ledger here. But, you know, this is where the really interesting, fun things uh, are happening, and we'll be talking about that. So as I say there, we'll be talking about both the process needs, uh, case management, document management, those sorts of things, uh, which, of course, used to be the only thing we could automate. But now, of course, the more interesting thing is around the decision needs side. And that's something that is affecting everybody. So I just wanted to show you, this was a screenshot from our case management system that we did in Bosnia. And this is just to give you a, a, a you know, quick view of what something would look like in the case management system. Now, case management systems are, what I always try to explain to people, are the accounting systems for the court cases. And literally, they are accounting systems because we track financial payments and, and fees and all those sorts of things that are due. And we also track trust funds and we track all kinds of different financial aspects of things. But uh, mostly they're uh, built to create documents and to register the events and the documents that are received. And then of course we want to schedule uh, and we do a lot of things with scheduling, and there's tons and tons and tons of different little aspects to this. And it's a very, very complex database. And that's one of the things that a lot of people have uh, run into problems uh, all over the world in developing these systems because they are complex relationships of a lot of different data. So until you've done a few, uh, you can really uh, get yourself into a lot of trouble because a registry book, a traditional docket book may look very, very simple, but the data relationships in them are not. So anyway, I just wanted to pass that along. Case management systems are something that if you work in a courthouse or you work as a law clerk, you'll become very intimately familiar with the systems that you end up using simply because that's where the data is. And then, of course, that's where the data comes from for the uh, public access. So this is a good friend of mine, Lydia Gardner, down in uh, Orange County, Florida. And they have a very nice uh, public access system you know, in terms of searching the case records. You would be searching their case management system. Uh, same thing with the traffic records, family records, all those sort of things, and the court calendar. Now, the court calendar, though, down in Orange County is actually um, a little bit separate because the judge's court administration runs that. But here's the portal into that's that, that uh, part of the system. 
So this huge accounting system is keeping track of all this data, you know, the parties, the attorneys, their addresses, your notifications, all that stuff is all kept track through these types of systems. And then you access them through the public portal. So uh, the big growth in case management has been the addition of electronic document systems. And electronic document systems, uh, of course, are being fed by the e-filing systems, which we'll talk about in a second. But unfortunately, we still have a lot of paper records. So this was a very nice scanning station I took a picture of up in Washington State, where you have the inside and you have the person uh, the in documents, and then they're putting them through the scanner that's right in front of the lady there. And then they have the output on the other side. And we're still doing a lot of scanning. And one of the things my friends are doing in Iowa is providing scanning capability in the courthouse to uh, self-represented litigants or attorneys who uh, come to the courthouse so that they can go and digitize the data that is coming in. So, you know, again, you know, a lot of people have scanners. But uh, we, of course, want to make this uh, capability available. So that conversion from the paper documents to electronic documents is one of, is the big thing that's going on right now. And so the primary way we really like to uh, <laughs> to really like to try to get the data into the system is through e-filing. So this was a, a diagram. A, a, conceptual diagram that I built for a very large western state uh, just to kind of think about how the different folks and the different users will interface into the case management and the document management system. And you can see that I have them uh, designated as being called untrusted and trusted filers. Now uh, that was not politically very correct. And so they actually uh, requested that we change that to uh, registered and unregistered. But the difference really is, is that you have self-represented persons who in the United States, we don't have any kind of national ID card or anything like that, which other countries do. And so you basically have to treat them somewhat differently with you know, more caution in terms of whether or not this is a, a, an actual person who's wanting to make an actual lawsuit or an actual filing or just being malicious uh, coming into the courts. And we have that happen in uh, the manual systems uh, also, but you know, the electronic, of course, makes it a little bit more uh, sort of convenient. And then we have different users. We have electronic filing service provider users. Uh, that's the approach that they were looking at trying to take. So these are registered users, typically attorneys or uh, large firms, uh, you know, maybe property management companies who would be filing into the system. And then we have our government users. And then these bulk filers, uh, the, the, the better example there is those are like property management companies that are just filing lots and lots and lots of cases, uh, very small cases, but uh, in, in huge volumes, collections agencies, things like that. And so you really want to try to deal with them a little differently. So the, the idea there is that we're going to have these different folks that are wanting to file with the court and they have different needs. And we want to design the system around those needs and to facilitate and make it as easy uh, and efficient as we can. And as you can see in the middle here, we have a whole set of systems there to deal with the data coming in. And then, of course, we're connecting on the back end to the case management systems. So it's kind of the concept there. The thing is, is that once e-filing is uh, initiated in courts, uh, people are very, very happy to be uh, using it. So this was a diagram or an uptake a diagram that was done uh, in Reno, Nevada, in Washoe County. And you can see that in 2007, the uh, number of e-filings was only 2%, whereas paper filings was 97%. Uh, and then, but, and of course, they, they're scanning that. So that's a huge hit on the workload of the court staff. But as you can see, over time, people want to e-file. And so even just over four years, you're, you're closing in on 50% uh, of the documents being uh, submitted to the court are being e-filed, and the paper documents are decreasing. And uh, the, the court in, in Washoe County really has only uh, looked
looked at particular case, uh, civil case types, and really haven't done a whole lot of work in the self-represented litigant area. So you can still see, though, it's a, it's a significant impact because, of course, who are the major filers or the people that really put uh, focus or, or uh, burden on the courts, I shouldn't say burden, workload, <laughs> workload on the courts, is really the, um, the, the, the law firms and the attorneys because they're the ones who send the big documents. All right. Now, of course, there's lots and lots of issues uh, revolving around electronic records. And, of course, the key one is privacy and public access. And since we have a tradition of public access to open public access to all court records, it's quite a stress on the courts and the legal system to determine really what does that mean. Because with identity theft and other uh, issues uh, revolving uh, the protection of the uh, persons who are involved in cases or have their names, you know, as being associated with cases, that's, uh, of course, you know, increasing a lot of, of risk and, to people. And so, you know, we're really struggling and working through all of those issues as to what should be made public record, what should, what needs to be redacted, how, who's going to redact it, how is it going to re be redacted, how to deal with uh, issues when redaction fails. Um, just lots and lots of, lots of uh, pieces of that. And of course, uh, there's these perceived security risks that all of this uh, document information can be accessed, as it says, without a trace, supposedly, uh, can be changed without a trace, supposedly. And so, you know, we have to design around those uh, those both real and perceived risks. There's no doubt that those are real, but those are also things that can be dealt with. And of course, you know, there's a perception, particularly from uh, my legal professional friends, that they're going to have difficult finding the documents. But luckily, we have a lot of, of uh, examples and evidence now that says that we can actually find the documents <laughs> in the electronic system much easier than we can in the uh, paper-based systems where files get lost on a daily basis in courthouses all over the country. Uh, of course, we have problems with computers breaking or electricity going out, but uh, what I've seen in courthouses is that when the electricity goes out, everybody stops working anyway, so I don't think that's necessarily been a problem. Uh, and that was true back in my ancient times when I started. <laughs> and then, uh, of course, uh, the, the feeling that somebody besides the presiding judge has control, that some computer uh, administrator someplace in the, uh, in the ether uh, has more control than the uh, uh, organizational head. And so, uh, of course, that has to be dealt with. But, of course, the balance is, is that the massive amounts of paper security risks where documents are lost or created fraudulently or all kinds of different issues with paper that are just as big of a problem, if not more, than the electronic systems. And so, you know, these are the, these are the things that we're working through and balancing. All right. So one of the things that I look toward is something that uh, if you like to buy music from Amazon or uh, iTunes, you know quite a bit about because you are under the uh, control of the digital rights management systems that both Amazon and uh, Apple have created. Now, there's some real benefit in the legal area to create that those kinds of controls because uh, on a paper document, anybody with a copier or a photo scanner or whatever can go and, and uh, carry those things off. And uh, in uh, the rights management systems, uh, you can actually have a little bit more control where you can actually provide licenses, limited time licenses to access a view, uh, use, the, use the documents. So these are, this is an area where you're using digital signatures and some of the uh, capabilities in the system can provide you with actually some more, you know, a little bit better. Uh, control and access. Of course, that doesn't stop somebody with a uh, phone on a, a camera on their phone from taking a picture of the document off the screen once you display the screen and, of course, then storing that. But uh, one of the things is that it's going to be pretty obvious that it's not the, uh, the actual document, that it was somehow fraudulently uh, obtained and uh, we can track it, you know, they can uh, take some legal action on that. Anyway, 
it's something digital signatures are going to, are becoming a huge, huge area of development. And uh, one of the things that's actually going to push this is the uh, Adobe's uh, purchase uh, acquisition of the EchoSign company uh, that happened last year. And they are now embedding the EchoSign capability inside Adobe Reader. And uh, of course, a few Acrobat, the full Acrobat Pro, so that you can digitally sign and, uh, of course, pay your fee to authenticate that digital document. So I think we're going to see a lot of, of uh, action in this area in the upcoming years. All right, something that I really, really think is a great thing. This is a, a new concept that's being developed uh, by some researchers, primarily in Italy. Uh, that's what the leadership is. But we still have the need to be able to uh, present and authenticate documents in and of themselves without, uh, you know, out of band or inter internet connection uh, authenticity uh, capabilities, you know, like digital signature would require. So the concept here is that you would create this type of either watermark or I call it a border stamp that would contain this uh, kind of complex number, but it's called uh, generically in the computer world, it's called a permalink. And a permalink would identify this document no matter what happens with systems in the future because you would always carry the permalink uh, number designation with the document forward in any kind of system. So anything that future proofs things is a, is a good thing. It's something that I think is a, you really need to be con considered and looked at. So the concept here that I just, I made up a dummy here, is that you would actually define the, the, court, the, the country, the state, the court, the case number, the unique identifier, document number, and all those sorts of things. And then it could be displayed on the document. And I was working in South Africa uh, last year, and one of the things they were telling me was that, that some clerks were being bribed to uh, falsify documents. So they would change um, a name, but of course, you know, the rest of the document is probably the same, you know, they would do the total ton of work, you know, to basically do, a, do fraudulent things, you know, seize an automobile or seize an apartment or something like that. So one of the concepts we had there was to uh, be able to text in, you know, maybe uh, like this URN Lex number, maybe the last 10 digits, the last 20 digits, at least have the text back to the phone with what, where that document came from, when it was signed, who it was to, you know, something that would fit in a nice uh, Twitter 140-character uh, sort of uh, message format. And they could determine whether or not that, that, that document had any kind of authenticity or not. And, of course, I'm sure they'd work around that, but you know, as smartphones get out there, we can do more and more there. So anyway, the point here is that we need to go and, and think through both uh, verification online and verification in and of itself as part of the entire plan and system. So one of the things, of course, is self-service. And as people uh, want to be able to e-file and create forms, we want to uh, provide uh, folks with places and information and uh, capabilities uh, so that they can help work with the legal system themselves. And this is a picture of the Maricopa County Self-Service Center in Phoenix, Arizona. And it just basically, as you can see, it has a whole lot of forms up there. We're still uh, killing trees. So uh, what we're starting to see is particularly a good example is Orange County, California, the other Orange County. And they're out, they actually have terminals and PCs there for people to fill in using their their uh, ICANN software to be able to create their own court forms and things. So, uh, and I know you're going to bronze out and things, so I'm not going to talk about this very much. The guided interface, they call it GPS interface and things that uh, will help people to be able to work with the uh, court forms, which of course are designed by lawyers and are, uh, as I call it, user vicious. Uh, types of types of uh, interfaces. Uh, I think we can do a little bit better, but I'm going to let Ron talk about that in another class because, of course, he's the man. Thank you for uh, showing that, though. <laughs> that was oh, yeah. 
that was our A to J author software, which Callie's developed. Full disclosure here, and yes, we will we will cover it in depth in the uh, legal aid uh, online forms uh, uh, session, which is a couple of weeks away, I think. There we go. The, uh, the the I just finished writing an RFP to develop such a system for uh, the Michigan courts. So hopefully we'll be uh, getting in proposals for that uh, in the near future. The Look forward to uh, it. Yeah, I know you'll definitely get on the uh, mailing list. <laughs> the, uh, the the other aspect, though, is that you know, of course, th those darn young folks. Those young folks are not using you know necessarily uh, computers at their desk. They're using their phones, their smartphones, their tablets, all kinds of things. So you know, we also have to design around the fact that uh, the world and the technology devices are changing. So the courts have done quite a bit of work in this area. You know, of course, we have the traditional call centers, and some of those call centers, like in um, Arizona, are dedicated to collections. So you know, both good and evil. What can I say? Uh, <laughs> digital dictation is becoming uh, widespread, where the judges or the attorneys can go and dictate to a mailbox, and then it can actually be typed up somewhere by somebody in somewhere in the world and returned, uh, sometimes within the hour. Uh, obviously voicemail is a no-brainer, but you know, of course we have lots and lots of directed voicemail uh, systems that uh, courts have implemented to at least you know, guide people to the right place in the courthouse and the, in the organization. The PACER system uses an actual interactive voice response uh, capability, again, just like you would do with your bank account or your credit card number or something like that, where it'll read you uh, back what's the status of your case or the uh, last filing. And uh, one of the other ones is called Vines, is the victim notification system, where uh, a victim uh, can choose to be uh, telephoned when, uh, say, somebody is released from jail or prison. And, uh, you know, as long as they maintain their phone number, the system will keep calling them until they actually uh, respond, either through a code number or voice uh, response that they have received the message. So, of course, this is very, very uh, good for uh, personal safety of people who have been victims of crime. And then uh, we're starting to see smartphone apps. So the, um, the QR code uh, right there that's on this slide is from Philadelphia, uh, the courts in Philadelphia and First District Court uh, in Pennsylvania. And they have developed a smartphone app uh, to access their court records and, and information. So uh, you can hit the QR code and it should take you to, uh, to Philadelphia to go check out what they've got going there. But, you know, there's lots and lots of things. I just wrote an article about the possibility of forms, for example, and signatures on smartphones. Uh, so things that are like field uh, workers, like the, um, the probation officers can go and, uh, you know, start to develop uh, things around this area. And I would love to see this be done with law enforcement also. And then uh, we talked about the instant text messaging uh, aspect. All right. So... Once we get technology, we have to deal with courthouses. And so courthouses are a huge challenge. And then we have a wonderful new book that was just done, if you're interested at all in architecture, of uh, courthouses that were built uh, from 2001 to 2010. And uh, I, I love architectural uh, pictures and drawings and things. So it's really tremendous, and it kind of does a best of. And you can see some really, really great innovative uh, work that's being done to open up the courts and the justice system to the public and make it more functional. But when we get into courthouses and I have to deal with technology, I've got to deal with, you know, is it a new or old building? Am I going to, is it, is it on the historic registry? Do I have to uh, go and, and deal with, you know, the wireless won't go through the walls because they're made out of uh, marble and concrete? <laughs> you know. It's, Signal doesn't tend to like that very much. Um, you know, what's the status of computer cabling? Uh, what's happening with their cellular capabilities? Can I get a cell phone signal in the courtroom or not? Uh, sometimes you want it, sometimes you don't. And then, you know, all the issues around security and how the workflow and everything works. So we have a lot of challenges in technology with dealing with our buildings. So this is a good example. 
uh, if you are ever, and if, you know, it can happen, if you are ever in Fort Wayne, Indiana, the most gorgeous courtrooms I've ever seen in the world, literally. And I've been to the Spanish Supreme Court. I've been to the U.S. Supreme Court. This place is a museum. And, of course, you know, with this huge, beautiful glass, you know, 30 feet foot tall ceilings and everything, they weren't particularly designed for dealing with uh, visual displays like large screen monitors like you can see on the front of that uh, podium. So they've actually done some pretty innovative things to be able to work the technology into a very historic uh, courthouse and display. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, creativity that's being placed in this area. All right, and of course, uh, when we're dealing with courthouses, we deal with adjacencies and how to deal with uh, the flow of people through the courthouse, and of course, keeping people uh, informed. And so we'll have things um, like the flow of the cumatic systems, how the waiting areas are dealt with, the, what type of paging and or uh, queuing systems that are being displayed on the screens. And uh, as it says down there, controlled video viewing. Uh, the Mesa uh, Municipal Court in Arizona has is one of the newest and nicest courthouses that's in the country, and they have wonderful workflow. And uh, when I was there, they had a video viewing room for people to watch the, um, the release hearings uh, from the local jail. They didn't have to go to the jail. There wasn't a, didn't have problems with the uh, security of trying to have to uh, go in and see people, uh, all those kinds of aspects, and you know, or transportation problems. And so they were able to go to the courthouse and watch the hearings there uh, in a viewing room. Um, and then, as it says, uh, as we're designing courthouses, we're designing them for conversion from physical stories to digital because at $300 a square foot, that's a pretty expensive paper warehouse is what uh, courthouses cost. And we have some courthouses in the country who have run up to almost $600 a square foot, uh, certainly in you know major metropolitan downtown areas where it's very, very expensive to build. And uh, it's very, very... Uh, so say complex buildings. So uh, those are the types of things that are uh, try to minimize. And of course, libraries. Libraries as physical books, uh, just the fact that the government has a very uh, hard time funding the acquisition of those materials, uh, that's, a, that's also a, a key uh, driver of transition from the uh, physical to the, uh, to the uh, digital world. As I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, where we have a lot of stuff being done with video. And so uh, this was something that we drew up a few years ago called Video Anywhere, where you have lots of different personal cameras, you have courtroom security cameras, and the ability to uh, uh, control and switch them, you know, connect the video conferencing to the right person or persons, multiple site, and have uh, recording, you know, to be able to record those sorts of things. And again, you know, I'll put them to the various different uh, devices. And so I'm going to have to make a new picture here to put somebody with an iPad as one of the outputs. So, uh, you know, video is just becoming huge. Uh, I have a good friend who's a justice on the Louisiana Supreme Court, and they have a uh, requirement that certain justices are uh, distributed throughout the state. So their home offices may be a three, four, five hour drive away from New Orleans. And of course this kind of, uh, you know, that kind of travel kind of, you know, wears, definitely wears on the person if you have to do it every month. So uh, one of the things they did was they use a multi, uh, I call it the Brady Bunch picture. They have a multi-camera, multi-site uh, video uh, conference capability that works from their PC and uh, uses a particular service uh, to be able to do that. And that means that instead of 12 times a year where they have to drive to New Orleans, they've cut it down to six. And they're very, very happy with that. Same thing with you know massive amounts of use uh, with uh, jails. And, and now a lot of testimony, particularly you know when it's uh, stipulated in civil litigation, uh, where people can appear from literally all over the world and have been doing this for a number of years with really no, no major issues. 
Now the really exciting thing, um, this is my our good friend, uh, our good friend Judge uh, down in Manatee County. This uh, this bulletin article that we wrote is on his work to create an electronic judicial bench because we can e-file, we can e-store in the in the clerk's office, but if we have to print those documents for use in the courtroom or use in the chambers or by the judge when they're making their decision, we're not really winning a whole lot of efficiencies or cost savings. So uh, he's uh, been working uh, with uh, several, a couple of his vendors to develop this electronic judicial bench. And if you go to this blog uh, note, I think actually I have a screenshot here. Uh, you can see this is uh, something that he uses with his touch screen, which on the previous picture you can see uh, laid over. Uh, it's called an all-in-one PC. He's got an all-in-one PC laid over there on his bench in, in his courtroom. And then this is the display that he shows. He shows the, uh, the various different uh, ways to access you know, his calendar, the cases that he's going to be seeing there in the courtroom that day, uh, any response templates. If he has to look up something in Westlaw or Lexus, he's got that access there. And uh, there's several different uh, major screens that he does, but it's all generally very easy and it's all touch enabled. Uh, so it's really exciting to see that and it's something that uh, is, is a great development now. So there we go. I think I actually almost hit my time frame. So looking forward to the questions. All right, took me a moment to uh, unmute myself, and now I'm being given the screen. I think you can see uh, some of the questions. I've been also monitoring the questions. Can you hear me still, Jim? Yes. Excellent. So, um, so let, yeah, let, let, let's let's go through a, a few of these. Um, I've got uh, this was my question actually. Um, it, it, it's kind of wonky, but uh, I'll ask it nonetheless. You know, are we headed towards a, a single standard for court records or for court administration records? You know, some some sort of XML. Or are we going to go down uh, the, the path of many vendors, many proprietary siloed systems that we'll eventually learn is a, is a, is a problem in open records in the future? Well, I, I think the, the probably the latter is probably going to happen, but it's not for lack of trying for the former. Uh, I think we're trying in several different standards, one of them being the, um, open, the OASIS Open Legal XML ECF, quite a mouthful, uh, standard for the e-filing and so that will give a lot of information about the case information the parties you know kind of the uh, the header metadata for the documents uh -huh. I think that's that's the first thing the second thing that's happening which is really exciting and I I'm just I'm, I'm in love with the uh, <laughs> Texas Supreme Court right now is that they have actually gone and made the leap where they said we don't want to get any documents that are scanned anymore. If you are creating these documents at all with any kind of computer system, we want those PDFs to be searchable. And so if you go to the Texas Supreme Court website, you can see the rules and there's some, there's actually a uh, brief uh, creation uh, tutorial guide that they've posted. Really fantastic. So, so, so to know, clarify, yeah, to clarify, to they, they, they don't want the they don't want the image of the document. They want the underlying text um, of the document so that it can be um, indexed and searchable. Exactly, and so of course you know that what we all know about is Google <laughs> these days, and since you can basically Google anything you know that's on your desktop or in a server, these you know whether or not you actually like Google, do it yourself or use other products. Uh, I use I use a product called X1 on my desktop on my on my local laptop that indexes all my emails, all my documents, everything that's cert that has any kind of text um, uh, capability, you know, text uh -huh. embedded, and 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 I can find stuff. And I think that's the same point here is that we're going to have that combination of hopefully the legal XML standards. Now, in the also just real quick on the. On the criminal justice side, there's the uh, whole part 
of uh, technology development called NEEM, the National Information Exchange Model, that's mm -hmm. trying to make uh, the data smart for criminal justice. I've heard of NEEM. It's pretty wonky, though. So, um, oh. so let's let, let's go on to the next one. And yeah, um, no, NEEM is totally wonky, <laughs> and we yeah. need to run run very far away from that. <laughs> yeah. So, is there an opportunity for someone to create a an open source court management system that you know that would, um, uh, you know, I, I'm I'm thinking like a like an open office to uh, to Word sort of uh, a model. Because I've I've looked and I know other people have and, and there's there doesn't seem to be much of an effort in that space. It's all being driven by um, 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 like private vendors, yeah. Pri private vendors and big money. The thing that I mean, there's been several attempts at it, and there's it's it's a difficult thing because mainly there's. Uh, as I said, the complexity of the data in and of itself, and uh -huh. then it's the support. It's actually uh, being able to get in there and program the workflows, the organizational structures, all the financial aspects right. of things. So it's, right. It's Courts don't traditionally have large IT departments that right. would be willing to take on the customization necessary from a white box or a or generic court management yeah, system. Yeah, and it's tough. It's tough to do transfer systems. Uh, Colorado's coming off of a system that originated in Oregon. That's probably the one place in the entire country over 30 years where you actually had a transfer from state to state. Uh -huh. uh, a lot of state, I mean, we do have a fair number of states, uh, the biggest ones being New York, New Jersey, uh, in Alabama, of all cases, of all places, <laughs> I'm always teasing my Alabama friends, uh -huh. uh, that built their own systems and, and have done them over time. And they actually have quite nice systems that they've built, but they are very, very custom and very, very de you know, detailed for their particular types of courts and court processes. So they weren't built to move to another system. Well, and the landscape, is, the landscape is 3,000 counties. Right, and so almost as many like courts. Yeah, it's like fifteen thousand courts is what we, we always. Oh my goodness! Yeah, so you know, I mean, the the other thing about state courts uh, now, the federal courts, of course, you know, have a system, but uh, they're much smaller in terms of the, their requirements. Their they workload. What's it called? Uh, the, uh, the the federal court system is called CMECF, Case Management Electronic Case File. So CM slash ECF. And uh, they're going through a whole uh, reevaluation and uh, developing new specifications for their next generation of that right now. Interesting. All right, we've got a question from uh, somebody at a law school. Um, I'll just read it. My faculty are always quick to tell me, uh, to paraphrase, there's no point in putting all this technology in a law school courtroom because uh, most of the courtrooms in our state don't have any of it anyway. Most lawyers will never use it. What do you think about law schools that are building out these high-tech courtrooms? And I think it's, it's changing. It. I think it's changing massively. I, you know, I actually, and I go to a fair number of courthouses these days. I can't actually think of a courthouse that I haven't been in in the last 10 years that doesn't have something. I mean, you may go to individual courtrooms where they may have nothing, but, I mean, you have huge projects like Maricopa County's new courthouse where you have 50 courtrooms all equipped with, you know, this stuff. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think. <laughs> so, so it's coming, and so, and so maybe at this point, high-tech law school courtrooms might actually be relevant. Um, I remember working on the project here at Chicago Kent 21 years ago. Sure. And yeah, we, I mean, we built something that was a, that was a wonderful and advanced thing, but yeah, the, the, the local courts in Illinois weren't, weren't up to, the, weren't up to the, the same level. And so the educational value of it was, but was not much. Well, you know, it was at least, you know, for, what you want to do is you want to be skating to where the puck is going, to quote Wayne Gretzky, you know, sure, you don't want sure. to be skating backwards, you know, it's like, okay, well, you guys, look, we got to learn how to fill up the oil lamps. <laughs> That's kind of silly. Good but point. yeah, I mean, you know, you go to DuPage County, you go to, uh, you know, our friends, you know, just up to the north is it King, King County. 
those uh -huh. those those courthouses are very very sophisticated. Good point. All right. Um, the next one is um, from a, a somebody who teaches at a paralegal school. They teach paralegals, um, and the community says they need to teach e-filing, um, but they can't duplicate the the e-filing system in the classroom. You know, um, do you know of any court programs where the schools can, uh, where the local schools, oh. such as my paralegal school, are partnering to uh, to accomplish the goal of teaching? It's um, a really students. good idea. I, you, you should, uh, whoever sent this question in should email me, and we should try to explore this with some of the e-filing vendors that are out there because they can certainly, they certainly have demonstration systems. Yeah, so I was they have the made available. It shouldn't be a hard thing at all for them to create one. So why don't you go? Ahead, you know, whoever sent that in, email it to me. You know, my name's on the first. Uh, my email address is on the first address. Or the first slide, and uh, we'll see what I can. We'll we'll try to explore that. It's Excellent. So, do you think at some point that we'll see a nationwide signature system that can incorporate all attorneys, so that law practice will become totally electronic? Yeah, I love to see that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. You know, the problem is that we just have you know the, we have a lot of commercial uh, involvement in this area, and certainly a lot of people want to. So, I could see. That there will eventually be uh, authorizations, you know, be done to these, or say certifications be done to these commercial systems. Certainly, the um, the secretaries of state, you know, following the um, was it Uniform Electronic Transactions Act, was it UETF, whatever it's called. Uh -huh. um, you know, they have electronic. A lot of the secretaries of state have that kind of capability now, and some of them are actually. Uh, you know, making some of that available, uh, but I could see. I think it's mostly going to come through the commercial providers, and uh, but you know how that's connected, how that's being recognized by the courts uh, is all you know, work to be done. But yes, I would love to see a single one, but until the uh, national ID card comes, uh, I don't think it's going to happen. Well, and th there's a lot of problems that would be solved by a national identity system, but there's but a lot of fear that that would also inject or create a lot of problems, and I think why it everybody might be a generational up, thing. I was just going to tease you and say why everybody puts their stuff up on Facebook. <laughs> well, well, that, that's where I was going to go. Was it might be a generational thing, which means in ten years we're going to go. What were we thinking? We don't have privacy, so of course everybody can have an, a, a national ID. We can't have a national ID system. But yeah, the boomer generation really. is distrustful of government. Generally speaking, I know I'm 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 just shooting from the hip. I, yeah. I don't know. I, I don't know how that's going to eventually play out, though. Exactly. Exactly. So, I mean, I think I think it's exactly it. The the Europeans are certainly on that track. So I think you know they will they'll show us uh, maybe some business efficiencies that uh, will help to drive things forward. Yeah, I really like X1. I think it's a terrific. I've I've tried tried almost every other desktop system. Uh -huh. Out there, including Microsoft's, and they all crash on me, uh -huh. <laughs> or have some kind of limitations and things. This sucker. And what's really great about it is, I have massive amounts of email files. You know, at least ten years worth in this one format, uh, in the Microsoft format, and they'll index those archive files, so I can find stuff from ten, fifteen years ago. Uh -huh. So yeah, X one. Big. All right, we've got a few files. minutes left, so. So how do you convince legislators to uh, fund technology um, when they're at present cutting judicial budgets? Ah, the, the subject of the moment. Uh, if you go to my court technology bulletin, we just posted a return on investment article on technology. Uh -huh. Really, 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 really uh, very proud of that one. Uh, worked with uh, my court friends. Actually, the, the going green is a is part of the ROI. That's kind of a new. That's that's kind of an argument there it is. for e filing. But this is the big one. Yeah, with that returning, uh, calculating uh, e court return on investment. We actually have a spreadsheet in there you can use to calculate now. To balance that, the next articles that are coming. I don't know if it'll be next week or in a couple of weeks is that we have to also do an evaluation of the current staffing and you know how much workload is actually already being uh, done or uh, not done by the courts uh, by the court staff that's uh, already been cut 
So there's some really good work that my colleagues have done for the, um, it's called weighted caseload studies, but weighted caseload studies is really uh, a misnomer because it evaluates, you know, uh, the amount of work that's required to be done by the judges and by the court staff. So we've got to uh -huh. do the return on investment aspect, you know, how much can be saved and the amount of work uh, through weighted caseload study. And so, uh, yeah, just watch, watch that space. We'll be having that article. <laughs> So subscribe to your Core Technology Bulletin blog um, in your RSS reader. You can, uh, or the you can get, uh, hang on to the National Center Twitter feed. Uh, you know, either either the RSS or the Twitter will get it, get you the info. What is the Twitter feed? Is it NC? It's at NCSC. Pound Just that with exclamation mark. <laughs> I don't, you know, whatever the tweet hashtag is. <laughs> okay. If you go, to, if you go, if you go up to the corner on the on the bulletin. Uh, back over there. Uh, there he goes. Follow, follow me. We got the little Tweety Bird there. Oh, there it is. Okay, and that's State Courts is the uh, Twitter feed. There we go. All right. <laughs> All right. Are there standards for redacting? I assume PII is private information from documents before making right. them available to the public. Some courts have developed them. You know, in terms of actually identifying the type of information that needs uh -huh. to be redacted. So, you know, particular identifier numbers, bank account numbers, uh, minors' names, those sorts of things. So, yes, the answer is yes, but it's being done on a court-by-court, uh, court, state state-by-state basis. Well, I remember uh, working with uh, Carl Malmid um, when he was doing the public resource, uh, the tar balls of cases, and he was he found that you know he was being contacted by people who said you know my social security number is in this case and you've posted it on your website, you know please remove it. He was a nice enough guy to do so, but he then attempted to find what is the standard procedure for informing a court that they have supposedly redactable information in their things and he found that, that that a lot of courts don't have a standard process by which or a person to contact right is, is, right is it no I mean, I, I, it, I'll, I'll put this negatively is it that bad that they don't yeah. even aren't even aware of the problem I don't think it's that bad now I think that everybody understands that as uh, once they uh, start uh, receiving these documents that there has to be rules Mm -hmm. uh, applied to them. Uh, I think the earlier systems where you were just, you know, bulk scanning all this stuff in and yeah. you were only really providing access and then all of a sudden then they flipped the switch and provided access out on the, um, out on the web. That, that was, those were big surprises. There's a, there was a large city in the Midwest that literally he turned, the, the, that clerk turned on access to the, uh, the scanned records. Uh -huh. uh, one, and it only lasted a day before the news media just ripped them up. And of course, he's an elected official, so he's jumping, you know. Yep. So it's 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 never as simple as it sounds. It's public record. Put it online. End of story. No, there's there's a devil in the details. Absolutely. Devils in the details. All right. Um, last question here is: uh, In my experience, many judges are uh, negative on technology innovations. Again, that might be a generational thing, but um, are they uh, are, are in your experience, are are judges uh, getting with the uh, with the tech program, or are oh, they? You know, it's it. You can do your old innovators dilemma. You know, curves and all those sorts of things. That's pretty much uh, what we see in the courts. You know, we have our, our early adopters, and then we have our our Luddites, and and you know, I I don't think it's really I don't think it's really much different than the rest of the population. All right, we still have some more questions, but I'm just gonna I'm gonna hit you with this. Oh, I can I can ask, answer the Fort Wayne black disc. Those are actually speakers. Uh, those are those are uh, speaker phones. They they have microphones and uh, audio speakers in there. Oh, okay. Now the zinger disc. I wanted to hit with you was the uh, was oh. the infringement case. Any comment about uh, the copyrightability of legal briefs? Oh, we had a big we had a big chuckle about that one yesterday because you know uh, we were I was teasing one of my judge friends saying they they need to put a big trademark uh, logo on the front of their uh, robes. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean I've seen this this is not really new. I've seen those lawsuits show up before. Uh huh. So. You know where you're trying to uh, capture intellectual property. Um, 
you know, once you turn it into, you, you turn, you hand it over to the courthouse. I haven't seen that you're going to have a lot of win on that. Now, of course, it's it's the downflow. You know, the the subsequent use after the uh, public use is is where the issue is, and so. You know, that's where the federal courts have made a good amount of money. And, you know, some of the systems that we're trying to develop are looking at that. Uh, my friends at the federal court actually told me that more than 95% of the PACER use, or around 95% of the PACER use, is from the big bulk data uh, vacuum companies. And wow. And so, yeah. 95% yeah. of PACER use is from third party vendors of that data? Yes, it's not. It's not actually the case uh, participants or the attorneys that are involved, or even so, the legal community. So, if this, if this, if this case has any merit, ninety-five percent of Pacers revenues are going to go away. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Which is it's, it's a problem because you know, unfortunately, the the general government funding our our, our fine folks in the legislatures and the governor's office haven't really seen uh, investment in uh, court and legal technology as being one of their priorities. Right, and, and so, so they've been depending on PACER to, to fill that gap a little bit. Yeah, or, you know, I mean, we have a lot of other uh, data sales uh, operations, you know, because they don't want to be sitting there in the courthouse like they do now. They want to get the tape. They want to get the CD. They want to be, uh, send it, send, have the file sent to them electronically so they can save their uh, costs, you know, sure. their, their sure. operational costs. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's one of those things where you look and say there's, a, there's definitely a balancing act here. Uh, between because there is certainly great value in, that these uh, companies bring to the um, to the public and to the, the legal profession in being able to compile and build this information, but I mean you know I think that we're still at the very very beginning. I've been watching and been surprised um, because there hasn't been as much development in what I call um, let's see data analysis of like the judges decisions I think we see some of it but you know you're looking for how do I argue and win before this judge sure computational linguistics um, exactly. geometrics mm -hmm. thank you exactly so those are all things that I think that are is huge and you know is something that uh, you just have to you know, judges and, and the legal community just have to be aware of is that this kind of data mining is 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 happening and is going to be actually growing Excellent. Well, Jim, thank you very much. Uh, we went over our time. I'm sorry, but uh, the conversation just got so interesting. Um, uh, I apologize to the folks that had to leave early, but I wanted to make sure they knew that there was uh, that homework assignment three is now posted on the blog. Um, it's a little bit uh, simpler than last week. Um, I want uh, the students to um, find the court website for the three jurisdictions that they're in, their county, their state and their uh, and their uh, federal district. If you're outside the United States, uh, you know, pick three court websites either locally or or whatever it makes most sense to you, and answer the following questions uh, in the homework wiki. Um, does the court support e-filing? And if yes, provide a link. Does the court support e-filing for uh, self-representing litigants, which is different than e-filing for lawyers usually? And if so, provide a link. Does the court provide an online docket or calendar system um, and provide a link? And then uh, does the court website have any forms that can be used either online or, or for downloading or for uh, interacting uh, with court processes? So a pretty straightforward homework assignment. It's basically find out some information and bring it back. Um, put it in your homework wiki and you'll get the badge. Um, that's it for this week. Thank you so much for coming. Next week our... Um, what is next week? And next week, I believe, is uh, Unauthorized Practice of Law. No, Unbundling Legal Service Delivery with uh, Richard Granite. And um, uh, we look forward to uh, having you all join us again. Thank you very much.